story that starts with good intentions, uh, but you know, paves the road to hell, so you'll probably guess where the story is going. The short story is this. Beginning in the 1930s, uh, uh, 400 uh, black men were diagnosed with uh, syphilis and then uh, promised treatment for it, but then systematically lied to about what they were really getting, used the placebos, vitamin pill, and when better treatments for the conditions that they had came out, they were uh, not informed about these treatments, and some active steps were taken to make sure they didn't get the treatments so that researchers could study the course of the disease. And they did so for 40 years, uh, making this uh, what uh, James Jones has called the longest non-therapeutic experiment on human beings in medical history. The longest uh, holding, uh, treatment experiment observation experiment human beings in medical history. Pretty stunning, all the more stunning than you haven't heard of it. I suppose if we did a Centennial Conference poll, only uh, a, a tiny minority of students would know anything about this. So after today, uh, fortunately, you won't be uh, among uh, the, the unknowing will be among the known. So here's the longer story. Uh, syphilis was sort of the AIDS of the last several hundred, hundred years. It had the same uh, stigma that comes from being associated with sexual transmission. It had uh, pretty horrific consequences, at least in many cases. Syphilis has some early uh, symptoms such as sores and so forth, and then it, it uh, goes dormant for a while, and then in 30% or so of the cases, uh, nasty symptoms, nasty uh, effects such as blindness and insanity and eventually early death occur. Uh, and so it's a, it's a tragic and, and problematic disease. In 1905, for the first time, uh, we figured out what the causative agent was for syphilis. And with that knowledge, a year later, uh, a guy named August uh, Wasserman, I believe was his name, came up with a diagnosis, a diagnostic blood test. So with simply taking somebody's blood, he felt they had syphilis. Well, once you've got the causative agent and a, uh, and a test, uh, you're down the road to trying a better, uh, having a better uh, stab at getting a cure. And so uh, by 1911, this guy's name is Paul Ehrlich, who was making some progress on cures or symptom treatments in some cases. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the older cures involve things like mercury ointments, bismuth put on people. Um, uh, Paul Ehrlich, who coined the term, by the way, magic bullet. If you ever heard that term about a wonder cure? Paul Ehrlich was looking for the magic bullet for syphilis. And he was trying things like arsenic derivatives and things like this, making some progress. And the spirit of the time was a certain amount of excitement that uh, some progress was being made about uh, diagnosing infectious diseases and doing something about it. Uh, in, in the wake of this excitement, the Public Health Service had a few ideas about uh, reaching broader groups of people with treatment. And here's where the good intentions came. Uh, in 1930, the Public Health Service funded a program, uh, the intent of which was to treat for syphilis 10,000 uh, African American uh, sufferers in Alabama. And that was a fairly ambitious number at the time. Now, this was in 1930, and there were two problems with the good intentions uh, almost right off the bat. Number one, they soon discovered that the program had been underfunded. They didn't realize how expensive it was going to be to really set the program up and, uh, and try to treat people. And then uh, you've noticed in the year 1930, by 1931, the effects of the Depression have government's coffers. And so the program's funding was just flat out cut in 1931. That means that only uh, just over a thousand people were actually treated in any way, in any kind of partial treatment. Now, at this stage, in comes a guy named Calvin Farrell Clark, who was uh, a big wig in the um, public health system. And Clark wanted to salvage something from what had already been set up. And Clark's idea was to do a six-month study, uh, an observation-only study, about what syphilis looked like when it went untreated for six months. He specifically wanted to see how it went in uh, African-American males. There was a study like this about white males that had been performed, it's called the Oslo study. And Clark was curious as to whether uh, syphilis would manifest itself any differently in the black population. So he's, he suggested and proposed a six-month study. Public Health Service picked it up and tacitly endorsed it. And so for six months, uh, uh, people were told that they were being uh, uh, examined and treated for 
syphilis, when in fact they were not. They were just being observed. And they were giving, they were giving placebos, sugar pills, etc. Now, um, uh, the Institute, uh, the Tuskegee Institute, uh, was paid by the Public Health Service to uh, administer this study. Uh, and that's a sad chapter in uh, the otherwise illustrious and proud uh, history of the Tuskegee Institute. Uh, um, people were very willing to work as nurses and interns in the study, in part because it was a paying government job during the Depression, which meant jobs to go around. Uh, the participants were recruited from the area around Macon County. Uh, it's not an insignificant factor that all of them were very poor, and almost all of them were delivered. Uh, and so, Uh, they were recruited uh, not only through the Tuskegee Institute, but also churches in the area and through community leaders. Uh, and, and that's what we had in the six-month study. By the end of the six-month study, I think there are a total of 600 men involved. 400 have been diagnosed with actually having syphilis and 200 not, but the 200 not were kept as a control to observe uh, how things went for them with the syphilis as well. Now, um, <clears throat> they were told, 400 were told, they had something. They were told they had bad blood. Uh, but this was still a, a under informing, I and mean, in some cases misinformed. Uh, because bad blood for the community at the time stood for not just syphilis, but all kinds of conditions. It could be uh, iron deficiency, it could be leukemia, it could be just low energy. So bad blood was kind of a, a broad term for a variety of conditions. So the, the participants in the study received a very non-specific diagnosis. Well, all right, at the end of the six-month study, uh, there was a conclusion determined, uh, namely at that point, it was clear that blacks and whites don't, uh, aren't affected differentially by uh, syphilis, and that's what Callie Farrell Clark wanted to find out. Uh, there was a, a view going around at the time that blacks were more resistant to syphilis, so at this point, it was um, increasingly clear that that was false. Now, for reasons that are somewhat unclear, uh, somebody wanted to extend the project and, and see how things went longer, see how syphilis went over the longer course of somebody's life. And so indeed, things were extended. Clark retired and started to feel a little sketchy about the whole situation. But he had successors who extended the study. At this point, somebody enters the story who's kind of interesting. She's the subject of a documentary I failed to bring down. Uh, not a documentary, a, a, a play. Pulitzer Prize nominated play called Miss Edwards Boys. And I'll talk about that later. Perhaps. Her name was Eunice Rivers. She was an African American nurse who was recruited to help uh, extend the study. She was given a car, uh, which she used to pick up participants in the study. And I guess one of the incentives uh, is to be uh, it's considered an honor to be driven into town for an exam by Eunice Rivers. She was also allowed to offer them a hot meal on exam. Uh, and uh, she was also uh, offering them uh, $50 towards burial if they agreed to uh, submit to an autopsy. After Those would be incentives given. The men who participated responded to these initiatives. And again, the numbers are 400 diagnosed with syphilis and 200 in control. Uh, many people talk about this as if it were a secret study. It's important, I think, to notice that it, in many ways it was not secret. You can look up the published results of the early stages of the study in the Journal of the American Medical Association around 1938. And so if the broader population wasn't aware of it, at least people who read JAMA uh, were aware of it. And if it surprises you that there would be an article talking about untreated syphilis and its effects over time, this was a time before, especially before World War II, when mm, doctors lied to patients about all kinds of things. Uh, if you went into a doctor before Cancer, people get on TV shows and die within six months or something. Uh, more likely than not, your doctor would not tell you that, thinking that you would live longer if you kept that information from you. Uh, doctors and researchers uh, also experimented on orphans uh, and the mentally uh, incapacitated. So, in some ways, the Tuskegee experiment was not uh, all that unusual in its early stages. There was experimentation and deception of experimental subjects floating around in the body. Now move to the middle stages of the story where the Tuskegee experiment out as particularly uh, worrisome, particularly 
Um, it goes like this. There were four months where the experiment clearly should have been stopped, even for the, the worrisome standards of the time, and then uh, it went on to our tests. The first moment is in 1938. In 1938, the uh, Congress passed something called the Venereal Disease Control Act. If you think healthcare problems are bad now, uh, imagine things then when uh, a broader group of poor people have really no health care at all. The Public Health Service started to worry about uh, the spread of venereal disease, and so Congress passed uh, an act that required there to be funding for treatment of a variety of venereal diseases, syphilis, of course, included. Um, the Tuskegee uh, part uh, participants, non-voluntary or perceived participants, rather, were excluded from this law. Uh, it was not required that they be treated. Not so much. It was mentioned in the law? Uh, uh, not specifically in the law itself, but uh, uh, as the law rolled out, there was an exception made by the people running the study. Uh, the next moment of interest is when World War II, when the U.S. Energy War II, um, as men in Macon County were drafted to be in the war, the local people running the study sought them out of the draft. Can you guess why? He was there <coughs> the research, research participants? That, but anything else you can look Would they even have been allowed in the war? Well, they would have had to pass a medical examination. Yeah. They would have been exa examined before they went to war. And guess what they would have been told? Hey, you have syphilis, and, and here's what we can do about it. Uh, the experimental, the experiment runners didn't want that to happen. And so they got local draft boards to exempt <coughs> participants in the study. That's pretty blank for uh, Number three. In the middle 1940s, penicillin became more broadly available. And it was uh, found to be an especially effective uh, treatment for syphilis. Here's the first time we've got a really interesting uh, way to treat syphilis. Uh, penicillin was, was systematically held from uh, members of the study. And finally, in 1947, uh, as the very horrific events uh, and experiments in Nazi camps become brought, uh, the Nuremberg Code is set up and tightens the reins on what can be done to experimental subjects. But remarkably enough, the skinny participants are again excluded from this. Uh, not to seem to fall under it, although it's very clear if you read it. Study should have been stopped. By well, fast forward now to the 1960s. In the 1960s, there were a few attempts, uh, largely unsuccessful, to get the study stopped. And here, probably the person to talk about is a guy named Peter Buxton. Peter Buxton was hired as a young social worker by the Public Health Service to work on, I think, largely on the area of disease. And Buxton became aware of Tuskegee uh, experiments by word of mouth. Uh, Buxton looked up the articles, read the data, and was horrified, and so uh, started to complain about it. And his complaints reached the Center for Disease Control, uh, where uh, Buxton was chewed out by a superior, a guy named Cutler. Cutler uh, made a kind of utilitarian argument to Peter Buxton. Cutler said, I'm well aware of the experience he was. He said, this data will help the black population be treated better for syphilis. And Buxton bought this for a couple of years. Then, uh, he then left the public health service to go to law school. But it's still bothered. Uh, it's still in mm -hmm. his conscience that he knew about this. And so in 1968, he wrote a letter to the CDC, um, attempting to go around cover this time. And uh, this time, some minor actions. The CDC convened a panel and examined the Tuskegee experiments. And believe it or not, they didn't shut it down even then. And their argument was this. Uh, they determined that the, the disease had been allowed to progress experiments such as so long that penicillin might do them more harm than good at this stage. Now, I'm not sure if that's good medicine or not. Uh, penicillin did have some nasty side effects uh, for late-stage syphilis, but it's not clear that they would have been on I mean, I don't know for sure the medicine. But that's what the CDC decided. And so Buxton gave up again until a few years later, in 1972, he turned over all of his materials to an Associated Press reporter. His name was Heller. Her name was Joan. And she broke the story. It was picked up by papers across the country. And uh, finally, there was outcry. 
So in 1972, almost 40 years after the beginning of the experiment, it was, it was finally shut down. Um, um, by this point, a number of people had died. Yeah. I was just going to ask, is that when they were finally, the patients themselves were finally told the truth in 72? Yeah, that's right. Not so until 72. all while the penicillin thing was happening, it's still living now. That's right. Uh, by this point, a number of them had died. Uh, 70 or 80 of the uh, 400 had died. Um, um, uh, most of them were complications from syphilis. Uh, many of them had, had infected their wives. Uh, there were uh, dozens of children born with congenital syphilis. So the effects of uh, the suppression of the information affected not just the men themselves, of course, but the people around them. It wasn't until 1997 that the country formally apologized. Here's Bill Clinton in 1977, 1997, rather. Uh, what is done cannot be undone, but we can in silence. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look you in the eye and finally say, on behalf of the American people, what the United States did was sh shameful, and I'm sorry. Uh, the last remaining person of the 600, he was in the control group died just three years ago, almost to the day died close to Martin Luther King Day, three years ago. Richard. So I'm going to ask, um, when the play came out and the subsequent movie? Oh, the play is called Miss Evers' Boys. It was written by uh, David Felchuk, is his name, uh, 1992. Uh, and there was an HBO movie made of it in 1997, uh, of which I have a copy, you're welcome to borrow it, if you like. Uh, felt she was very interested in the character of the nurse, Eunice Rivers, who focuses the movie mostly around her. And Rivers is interesting because she's the only person involved for all 40 years of the experiment. And she's a very complicated figure to think about. If any of you are looking for an interesting uh, honors project or semester project, Eunice Rivers, I think there's still a lot of work to be done on her. Uh, she, on the one hand, seems to be very committed to caring for her patients in one way, and yet she was uh, a willing participant uh, along the way as well. Uh, the, the best book on Tuskegee that, that's out, I think it's, a, it's only a little bit dated, there's still hasn't been a better book. It's called Bad Blood by a man named Jane Jones, and we have a copy in the library. Jones thinks that Eunice Rivers was uh, very, very uh, obedient to authority, and that the reason she didn't blow the whistle, the reason she kept uh, herself involved for so long, is that she trusted authority figures over her who said the same things Cutler said to Peter Buxton in the 60s. Let the observation run its course, and eventually this will be for the greater good of the African American population. We'll learn something that uh, will help civil suffers. Um, um, James Jones said uh, that uh, Ms. Rivers bought that, and that's why she, uh, why she stayed with him. Well, Tuskegee still casts a shadow, I'd like to argue. Uh, I want to make a couple observations. Number one, it's not clear to me that we would have even learned in 1970 what was going on about the civil rights movement. Uh, I don't know that Joan Heller would have broke the story with as much uh, attention uh, had not the events of the 60s uh, uh, Another thing to note, at least that I'm going to claim, is that Tuskegee casts a long shadow over health care for African Americans in the United States. If you look at social science data, there's still a deep distrust of the medical profession among the African American population. And although, uh, um, one researcher has noticed that there's some signs that this distrust goes back before Tuskegee. I think there's a good case to be made that Tuskegee exacerbated the distrust and made it worse. So African Americans, in many cases, uh, knowing, having heard what happened to Tuskegee, are reluctant to go into some healthcare providers, especially the poor and rural areas. But the uh, racism that uh, animated a lot of what happened to Tuskegee is, I think, manifest in other ways as well. So here's another piece of data that I find frightening. If you are an African American and you walk in with the same insurance card as a white person of your same age and gender, you will get less technology applied to your condition. I mean, that's something we can measure. It's often hard to figure out you know, exactly what's going on in the doctor's head and who's racist and who's not. But some data we can get a hold of is we can look at some medical charts, see when people have like conditions, and see how much technology is applied to diagnose and treat the condition. Well, significantly. Again, notice what I said. That's if your insurance is the same. It's not a question of if you pay or not. That's the problem. All right, whatever other students know at the Centennial Conference, uh, you now know about Tuskegee, and I hope it worries you and concerns you.
uh, about any kind of human subjects testing. Uh, you now know about the uh, longest non-therapeutic experiment on human beings in medical history. Uh, if we wanted to be fancy pants, we could quote Emmanuel Kant, the, the German philosopher and ethicist, who said, never use other people as a means only, use them all as a means. Where I'm from, we can say that a lot. So, um, differences in terms of um, sort of the perceived, I don't know if this makes sense, perceived genesis of these identities. So where, where it comes from, right, that, that one is perceived to be innate, one is perceived to be chosen. Okay, Yeah, uh, both groups have often been attempted to Silence that kept out of the public life, public discourse. Okay. Alright. Gays can more easily hide their identity? Okay. Right. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. Uh, both groups have been victims of hate crimes? Okay. Another, another difference, I would say, is, is the um, history, or maybe the history of oppression, that, um, I mean, African Americans have a history of the, the um, experience of slavery, gay and lesbians do not have that. Um, their history is one of a shared invisibility in the culture, um, less than sort of a shared um, act of oppression. Um, and I would also add it to the oppression thing, I, would, I guess I would also say both have been dehumanized in various ways. Um, and we have as recently our now ex-senator comparing um, gays and lesbians to um, bestiality. So um, we, have, we have that kind of dehumanization, a, a, a shared sort of reaction to these identities. Um, so I think, you know, there are, there are obviously modes where, I mean, areas where these two identities intersect, but the differences are, are fairly large. Um, but, but at the same time, this, this perceived sort of genesis of identities, which is something I want to get to later, um, is, is the actual identities, the actual genesis of the, these identities are, are innate. Um, there are I don't know, biological reasons for these. Um, but I, I want to get to that later, because that's also contested. Um, Okay, so we have the identities now. Now I want to get to sort of um, similarities and differences between the movements. Because this is where hopefully we'll get to actually talking about what the title of it this is. So between these two movements, any sort of similarities or differences between how these movements have progressed, what their aims were? Yeah. Well, I mean, in both the black the civil rights movement and like with, um, within the gay community, um, there, there, there are two kind of sections. I mean, one is like we should openly oppose anyone who like who tries to limit what we can do. While like the other half is like we should try to j just live peacefully. I mean, like we shouldn't try to be aggressive. Okay, so there's both sort of a uh, uh, kind of a Malcolm X approach and more right. like approach. Um, similarities in dealing with how vigilant yeah. the two movements should be, yeah. or or even active, I yeah. guess. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Like encouraging pride in both of you. Okay. Being proud of you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sort of psychological approach to the feelings. Right. Other similarities or what was a, a big difference we have, for example, National coming out of day with the ARS and couldn't have that with the Yeah. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Events would be slightly different. <laughs> Oh, we yeah. Um, very exciting. Like where pen. Yeah. Um, yeah, not exactly. It's the same. Um, what about methods? Approaches to, to gaming. So To me they're relatively simple in that they're sort of I'm not saying multi-pronged, I don't even know if that's a word, but um, the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s progressed through courts, through the court of public opinion, through legislative measures at the state level, at the federal level, and we're sort of seeing that sort of um, approach and movement with gay civil rights. Um, things are happening at the state level, things are happening at the local level that contradicts the state level, which contradicts the federal level, Things are happening in the court system. Things are changing in the public, uh, in public opinion. Um, so I, it's not just one approach. It seems to be happening at sort of all levels where where things could change. Things are being changed um, in fits and starts and in different ways. And things are going forwards and backwards at the same time in different areas, which I think are, you can see connections between both both movements. Um, I'd also say that there's um, Sort of the same, in addition to pride, there's efforts of, uh, at consciousness raising. Um, and you, know, you, you see efforts to educate those who are not members of this community on what their lives are really like, or by staging events to, to show people how these things are, are affecting them. You have the, you know, the boycotts in the 60s of, of um, the bus boycotts or sit-ins. Um, and you had similar things, especially in the 80s with ACT UP really, uh, related to AIDS, but still you have sort of these, you know, um, the, the, the marriages that happened in California and San Francisco and also in Massachusetts became these sort of public spectacles of, of um, showing people what their, regular people, what their lives were like. Um, I would also say you have similar sorts of um, sparks I guess, um, in the sense that, to me, Rosa Parks was a spark for, for the civil rights movement, and what she was protesting against was sort of a fundamental right of, of freedom of movement and freedom of, of transport and, and um, equal protection and access to public facilities. Um, and one of the major sparks for the gay civil rights movement was the Stonewall riots, um, which was sparked by you know, being tired of not having the right to freely assemble, which is something that's guaranteed to, to all citizens. Um, and that's, that wasn't being respected, and so they, they, they rioted. Um, I'm not going to speculate on whether it was also because Judy Garland had died, but that's up for debate. Um, I mean, it literally is up for debate. So uh, those are some of the things. To me, one of the key differences, and this is where we start getting into the actual Discussion, um, is what kind of what kinds of rights are being fought for, um, and what 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 is actually being fought for? So, what was King fighting for? What did he articulate as being important for, for this movement? Um, <laughs> All right, so for, uh, for King, equality in terms of <laughs> everything, okay, I mean everything is a decent answer, um, but he also talked a lot about economic equality, um, dealing with not just, you know, Equality in, 
motivations, but also equality in, in economic justice. Right. Educational equality. Educational equality. Yes. Definitely. Um, yeah. Voting. Voting, right. Um, voting has not been a problem for at least gay men. Um, that's, that's been guaranteed. Unless you're black as well. Um, uh, um, economic equality. Um, gays and lesbians statistically have a larger median household income, um, have greater spending power than other minority groups. Um, so that the economic justice angle doesn't really fit. At the same time, um, protection from housing or, or employment discrimination, those are still rights that are being fought over. Um, and we have something called ENDA, which is continually put forward in various state and legislatures and in Congress and is regularly ignored. Um, so that typically comes as a shock. It, it's, it's perfectly legal at the federal level for people to fire gays and lesbians for the mere fact of being gay and lesbian. So those rights aren't guaranteed in the workplace. But in terms of poverty, it's, it's a different discussion. Um, uh, education, um, it's not... I, I, I wasn't really going to talk about education, but since we are sort of in an institution of education, I thought I would. Um, in a 2005 survey of 1,700 LGBT students between 13 and 20, 64% reported that they have been verbally harassed at least some of the time, 37% experienced physical harassment, 17% experienced physical assault. LGBT students are twice as likely to report that they did not plan to go on to college than straight students. 81% report having never been taught about LGBT people, history, or events. Some of that sounds a little familiar to things that happened years ago. Um, I mean, there are states that have laws explicitly prohibiting harassment and discrimination against LGBT students. There are also states, however, that specifically prevent positive descriptions of homosexuality in schools. Nine states do this. Arizona and Alabama couple that with a requirement that schools promote heterosexual marriage. So um, it's not necessarily on the radar as much as gay marriage is, but to me, um, education still remains a battlefield over um, equal accommodation, equal access, and safety. Um, but really, gay marriage has been the, the big, big debate. Um, and it does have connections with the interracial debates, interracial marriage debates um, from the 50s and 60s. Um, same sorts of jargon and appeals to purity um, and sanctity. Um, but I think they're also fundamentally different. Um, and I, I think that um, one of the, let me, let me talk about the, the king function here now. Um, I think that there are two sort of key differences between what King put forward and his example and his strategy and what the current gay rights movement has. And one, I guess I would articulate as an overarching and cohesive vision. And the other is an appeal to morality. Um, so first, I would say that you know King had a comfort, you know, I guess we had a tough time articulating what King said about equality because uh, he, he was all about equality, but across the board, overarching vision of equality among all peoples. Um, and you don't have that with the gay civil rights movement. You don't have appeals to that, even. Um, at this point, there's a concentration, and some, and probably I would even say a fixation on gay marriage. Um, but there's no sort of articulated dream for an overarching equality among people. Um, it sort of catches catch can right now. Um, and to me, there's nothing overly inspirational about the gay civil rights movement. Um, there's not an appeal um, to other groups necessarily, like there was with King, bringing together different people. Um, and I guess one, I, I, I think that there should be. Um, 
And as evidence, I would point to last November um, in Arizona, for the first time, a Defense of Marriage Act failed. Um, Defense of Marriage Act, as you don't know, says marriage is between a man and a woman, which is this incredibly interesting thing to me as a student of <coughs> language that we're suddenly making laws that define words. Um, but uh, Defense of Marriage Act, and the Arizona one, I think, said um, also, and, and anything resembling something that's not between a man and a woman, you're going to get nothing. You know, anything that's not marriage, you're not going to get the same rights. Um, and it failed. This is the first time that that had happened. Um, and the reason that a lot of people said that it failed is that the, the, the approach from the, the people against this Defense of Marriage Act referendum was not just putting forward, you know, lovely pictures of LGBT families and saying, oh, we're, you know, we're being oppressed, we're being oppressed, but also putting forward straight couples um, and senior citizen couples who, frankly, didn't want to get married again, but they sure would like protections offered to them through marriage, through something like marriage. Um, and so you had um, a sort of wide spectrum of people going forward, and not just gays and lesbians. Um, so, I think, to me, there's not a broad coalition, but instead relatively distinct um, and sometimes petty groups um, and organizations. It's a much more codified movement right now with human rights campaign, uh, land and legal defense, and um, all these different sort of groups that are fighting amongst each other rather than working together and branching out beyond the LGBT community. Um, you know, King had to deal with this kind of infighting. Not pretending he didn't, but he dealt with it um, and found a way to bring these groups together um, and to accomplish something as enormous as the March on Washington. Um, and footnote, which was accomplished with Bayard Rustin, who was an openly gay um, uh, mentor to, to King. Um, I could talk about Rustin for hours. Um, but he grew up in Westchester and now has a high school named after him on the high school website. Doesn't mention um, fun. Uh, so, so you know, just side note about the march. You know, march is maybe sort of passe, and and um, you know, the the idea of civil disobedience right now just doesn't seem to really you know resonate um, in the sort of media culture and lack of attention that we have. But I would point back again to the efforts of ACT UP in the '80s to sort of really make these spectacles of civil disobedience and point out the. Um, the ways in which the government wasn't responding to the AIDS crisis. Um, so I think in terms of having a vision, a strategy, a coalition, uh, it seems to me that gay rights advocates would do well to look back at King and look at the ways in which he, he made a conscious effort to bring people together and expand out his vision and to actually articulate the vision. Um, but the way that that vision <laughs> needs to be articulated has to be rhetorically vastly different to me because um, King framed this issue, and the question of equality, um, as a moral question. Um, and he often used the Bible to support his points. For fairly obvious reasons, that's not really going to work. Um, we haven't, you know, there isn't some missing third epistle to Corinthians talking about Mary and Josephine, and there isn't, um, you know, Paul talking about James looking longingly at Simon Peter. It's not happening. Okay, so uh, we have to, if, if we think that morality is the way to talk, is the way to frame this issue, which I think it might be, um, we're going to have to sort of con conceive of uh, a morality that is outside of religion. It doesn't use biblical references, but that fights back with, fights against those arguments, which are the primary arguments against um, the special rights afforded to some to gays and lesbians, um, outside of religion. Um, and I think, obviously, King was right to use biblical references, and right to use religious references, because one, um, he was a preacher, uh, two, it seemed like the easiest thing to come by at the time, and three, I think he was dealing with a culture that um, responded well to that. And maybe we don't respond as well to that right now, but um, I think we do respond fairly well to right and wrong and emotional appeals. And I don't know that enough of that has been 
that gay rights advocates have you know, sort of said, this is right, this is, this is unjust, but not really backed it up with emotional appeals. And I think when you see the faces of these people or see the families who have, who have um, been affected by these laws, I think that's when it really hits home. Um, so I think the appeals to reason are good and have held up pretty well in the gay rights position. But I think more could be done from an emotional position. Um, so I think, you know, King, to me, can be incredibly instructive in this realm. Um, and I think that he recognized that progress towards equality needed to happen from a broad approach, include as many people as possible, and was inspirational. And, and, and maybe, you know, this movement is not accomplish as much as it could because it's lacking a king. There isn't a king out there. Um, but I don't think the civil rights movement was a cult of personality. I think it was, uh, he led it obviously and it was inspirational, but it was, it was a broad coalition. Um, so I'm gonna stop, but I have three things that I wanna leave you with that are sort of just pokes, okay? Um, <laughs> things that I don't know if I really believe in, but I wanna throw it out there. Uh, so, the first one I, I'm stealing from a friend. Um, I wonder if King's politics, which in its most hopeful form, as we said, had, had an overarching equality that sought to overturn multiple systems of inequality, economic, interpersonal, political, across the board. And I wonder if that vision wouldn't have a greater affinity with what is termed queer politics, which seeks to overturn traditional conceptions of gender, of sexuality, of interpersonal relationships, among other things. So I've been talking about a gay civil rights movement, but, I, but there's also a queer politics that is much more radical. I wonder if that wouldn't be more closely aligned with something that, that King would articulate. So this one's mine, and bear with me at this, this second one. Number two, oh, uh, this one's mine. So uh, bear with me, see if you can follow me. During King's time, race was a fixed category. Drop of blood dictated your race. Sexual identity was fluid, something that was considered either a phase or a mental disorder. At that time, arguments for racial equality were predicated in part on the fact that discrimination could not be based on what people cannot change. Now we're living in an age where race is increasingly troubled as a physical category. Um, as some geneticists argue that there's more differentiation within races than between them. And when more and more evidence points to biological sources for homosexuality. So, my point is this may be why gay rights are on the march and why efforts of racial equality like affirmative action are increasingly under fire. Just wondering. Last one is from King. And I'm just going to read it and then not comment. This is from a letter from Burbank Joe. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest, great stumbling block is his stride toward freedom, in his stride toward freedom, is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux planner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Thanks for listening. And please talk about it. So, it's 128, we have one three class. A collective call to morality, but a source outside religion. I think perhaps the ideals behind the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution might be a good rally cry because I think we need a return to those ideals rather than the sort of bellicose flag waving that we've seen in the past few years in general. And I think that's something that the ARS community can really co-opt um, for their benefit, for everyone's benefit, really. Like, what do you mean, the, like, 
uh, Locke, right. Jefferson, returning to those ideals rather than the right. nationalism borderline and jingoism that we see leading up to, for example, the Iraq War. Yeah. Um, it's, not the, it's not the Bible, but right. Right. it is something that is familiar to the majority of Americans, hopefully. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. The hopefully part um, is, I, you know, I, I think there's only vague senses of what is, you know, certainly the sources of our yeah. founding documents. But you know, I mean, when you have um, when you have George H. W. Bush being president of the National Constitution Center when he wrote the Constitution of Drugs when he was with the CIA, it's, we're living in a time when these things don't follow necessarily. So I mean, I I. I these principles would seem to be applicable, um, but I, I think on the rational side we're doing fine. Honestly, I think you know I think you know because for instance, the majority of Americans think that ENDA should be passed, that gays and lesbians should not be discriminated against in the workplace. That that's pretty much a done deal. I mean, it hasn't gone through Congress, but public opinion is definitely for it by a large margin. But I mean, when, it's when we get into marriage. I mean, I, frankly, I, I mean, I think the whole pursuit of gay marriage is a little ridiculous. But that's my opinion. It seems misguided, and, and that's, that's my opinion. I just have a question: What's your personal opinion on shows like um, Queer as Folk, Will and Grace, those kind of shows that try to comically address? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's what's, what's, I think that's what's changed everything. It's, it's all, it's going from invisibility to visibility. It's, it's really hard to hate someone that you know. And so the more and more um, that, that those, and that they become normal. You know, I think that's, that's changed everything. I mean, like, I love, I love the story of, of Michelle Nichols getting from she didn't want to go on Star Trek. And it's like, no, it's your duty. You have to do this. And, um, you know, I, I think the same. The, the visibility is incredibly important. You know, <coughs> culture is driving politics. Or it always does. Um, I'm curious about the Jewish community. Um, I think you're talking about the Bible. I don't know how long this lasted in the 20th century. In the 19th century, it was fairly common for people to argue that Bible approved of slavery. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. as Paul said, and, and in order to get past that, mm -hmm. uh, um, maybe the same could be done uh, uh, with the Bible. It seems there are many passages that many Christians take to be yeah. against homosexuality that are based on pretty tendentious people. Sure. So, so maybe but, it's too quick to give up on that as a resource for those who have to. Yeah, I mean, but you know, it's been tried. I mean, you know, it's been tried to say, like, oh, so you're going to pay attention to this law in Leviticus and not the ones that talk about, you know, not handling pigskin or not wearing different, you know, fibers on your body? Like, well, I don't know, but it's not, I don't well, know if it's working. People tried it too, but it, it seemed like King was able to at least use the language of justice yes. to, to his advantage. Maybe it's going to take some kind of charismatic right. he writes King to do the same Right. Well, and also, I mean, he was a preacher. He was he was an authority. He knew the Bible. So, I mean, you know, and I, yeah, I mean, we have we have gay and lesbian people of faith all over the place, and and they are you know saying things, but they're um, the, they're not afforded the authority to sort of buck against those. And I and I, I don't know the the voices that use the Bible uh, against these civil rights arguments seem to me to have the um, the bully pulpit. Very hard to argue against, and I think gays and lesbians are loath to argue that point. They feel like they're going to lose it because it's, it's an interpretive question. Then you know, it's like, well, you, well, I think this. Well, I can't really argue with you. So I don't know. So, I mean, that's why ideally I'd like to see something framed outside of religion, but it, it's really tough to do in our current cultural moment. Morality May I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Um, you seem about morality, so leave the Bible side, to be times ambivalent about whether the movement should make moral appeals or, or not. 
I don't think I'm ambivalent about saying that this is this is wrong because it hurts small children. I think that's a great to bring in the kids and talk about how it hurts, you know, my my friend Mike and Rob's two children that, you know, something was almost passed in Pennsylvania State a law that would have negated their adoption of these children. I think that's that's a good emotional appeal. Like, let's bring out the waterworks. I'm fine with that. Um, I mean I'm not, you know, not ethical in that way at all, so um, <laughs> I'm fine with that. I, I mean, if morality is fundamentally how we discern what is right and wrong, then yeah, we definitely should be making appeals to morality. But if, if, what, if our judgment of what is right and wrong is based on faith, then I think we're in murky territory. Um, so, related to that, what do you think about the general relationship or what it should be between the gay community and say um, liberal Christian movements like coming out of Yale Divinity, for example, I know um, William Sloan College has died, but I think he was a pretty big proponent of gay rights, but it seems like the two sides, not, not two sides, but the two groups aren't quite sure how to relate to each other, it's my overall impression, um, sort of wary. Well, I mean, there's a lot of historical baggage because, I mean, the, I think the gay, I think gay advocates are, gays and lesbians and, and the, the entire movement are pretty leery of religious groups. Not exactly the track record. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, for, you know, there's there's a gay Catholic group. Logic of that, but there's a gay Catholic group. And, you know, God bless them, literally. But, you know, I don't, I don't know how you, how effective they are politically, you know? And I don't, um, you know, the United Church of Christ has been amazing in the past five years in, in how supportive they are of gays and lesbians. Um, but at what cost? I mean, you see the Episcopal Church maybe breaking apart over this issue. So I think churches are also going, oh, well, we really want to stick our necks out for this justice issue. It's, it's a tough call for them. I think gays and lesbians are, are rightly skeptical. Differences, you know, I hear about, you know, sheer numbers, right? You know, in each group, and also the fact that the uh, the black group finally got support from the white group, white, and that's yeah, you know, I mean, we gay people don't have two hundred people to fill up the jail. You know? Well, they do, but but I would say I mean not in the, not in the numbers of black people. Not, I mean, it, it, I, I'm. I would, I would say, I mean, I think the issue actually is, is one of, um, this is where economics come in. Because I think that during the 60s, you had such, you know, segregation worked, but it also worked in reverse, in the sense that you had large groups of people from a similar background all together, living together. And you had easy access to those groups of people. They all went to church, or they were all in the same neighborhoods, or something like that. Yes, you have pockets of, of gayborhoods like in Philadelphia or Capitol Hill in Seattle, or you know you have these these areas where gay people tend to congregate, but they're much more spread out. So I think I mean I think it's an economic issue sometimes of, of gay people not coming together and not seeing the point of coming together. I mean the fact that they that you have very wealthy um, gays and lesbians not really interested in civil rights because it doesn't really affect them. Um, I think that's 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 another impediment to sort of getting massive movements. I mean, but there there have been marches. I mean, there have been you know. I guess I don't know. I I think that they they can come together. But they're not marches like in the '60s. I no, mean, I mean no. Uh, you know, people right. bust into Birmingham. They just kept right. coming and coming right. and coming and coming. I mean, right. there isn't that many people. Right. But the thing mm -hmm. that was is is like when they turned the fire hoses on those people. Right. And this, then this picture went around the world. Then they got and they got right. support. Well, and what was what was I mean? There was a, another huge seminal moment for gay civil rights in the past ten years. And what was it? Matthew Shepard. Um, so when you have a relatively photogenic young man being, you know, crucified essentially, that motivated and that woke people up. But we went back to sleep. But it's just that 
Yeah, a little brick wall. No, it is a brick wall. But I mean, you didn't, you don't have um, the, the the injustice against gays and lesbians. I think is much more passive and in, in sort of below the surface. And so potential allies don't see it. I guess that's a as it's not as obvious. It's like you know, I I see it as we've got endless endless mm -hmm. software. How, how could we do that? Right. Well, I mean, that's why I read the thing from King from my version. Yeah. Well, King, you know, I, and as far as the leader goes, I mean, King kind of bubbled up to yeah. the surface. I mean, you know, I mean, he, he failed in Albany, um, right? You know, but he just and, and also you were saying about the, the march on Washington. Snick, Snick was ready to make a speech against the mm -hmm. civil rights legislation that Kennedy wanted. Okay, the only reason they did it was not because you know they figured it was a better political move. They rewrote that speech. They were number six on the list, and they rewrote the speech, mainly because a 70-some-year-old man went up to him and said, please don't do this. I've worked all my life for this. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, it's